Well, this is lecture 36 of ECE 5312. And so in this lecture, we're just going to sort of briefly talk about frequency non-selective slow fading channels. We'll then jump into the beautiful area of diversity. Okay? And then we'll conclude that this lecture. So in lecture 35, we talked about different types of fading channels. We talked about Rayleigh fading channels, Rising fading channels, frequency selective fading channels, non frequency non-selective fading channels. What we're going to talk about is this particular type, and we're going to look at the performance analysis of it. But we're only going to do it in three slides. So you know this is going to be 30,000 feet, right? So what happens is let's, first of all, take a low-hanging fruit type of modulation scheme. Let's take FSK, okay? Something nice, easy. There are no Q functions involved, right? It's going to be good times. So what happens is let's mathematically model the received signal as we have some attenuation factor. It's constant. Let's say there's no time variation whatsoever. Um, let's say there's also an exponential term that induces some sort of phase rotation. Constant. Don't worry about it. Isn't, isn't this like almost impossible, right? Like constant attenuation, constant phase rotation. Like how many of us encounter problems in real life about that? Bless you. And then we multiply the attenuation and the phase rotation on the low pass transmitted signal, SL of T, or in this case L. No, no, should be T, bad me, typo. And we add complex white Gaussian noise to this mix. Okay? So far so good? So what we want to do now is let's say the phase changes, re this is our assumption, the phase changes really slowly. Whenever you see that in a scientific paper, they say, assume to be constant. Right? Oh, I love, I love technical papers. It's like, so what happens is the reason why we do that is we don't worry about synchronization. Like, have you ever seen a paper that produce, proposes a new modulation scheme? Oh, by the way, we also took care of the synchronization at the same time. No, they always assume perfect synchronization. Or the synchronization paper doesn't talk about the modulation scheme that it supports or anything like that. Right? Oh, there's also phase rotation. So, so. so let's calculate the probability of error. And so if we use BPSK, which does have a Q function, or FSK, which does not, actually it does. OK. Oh, because in the last lecture we looked at um, kind of an approximation to that with the, complex ex uh, with the exponential re uh, representation. OK, so we, we all agree that the bit error rate for BPSK and the bit error rate for BFSK are those guys, right? Q functions are off by a factor of 2 inside the argument. So what we want to do is how do we represent fading in this performance analysis? I think that's the burning question, the million dollar question is. Like we, we did the performance evaluation techniques and derivations for AWGN. We kind of slightly looked at it when we had band limited channels, right? And when we looked at when we looked at modulation schemes, the exact representation, we had to assume that every signal was orthogonal to each other, right? That was the only way to get an exact uh, expression. What well, we're going to do simple modulations. We're going to see what is the impact of fading. How does this impact the performance? So rating fading, let's assume that these signals get attenuated by alpha. Okay? And so what happens when you take alpha squared? And alpha is Rayleigh? We get chi distributions. We get chi squared okay, with two degrees of freedom. And it turns out that gamma b is also chi squared distributed such that, and so with chi b, I mean, sorry, sorry, gamma b, what it is, it is the signal to noise ratio, right? So what happens is we have this expression here, right? So we have gamma b um, bar, and that's the average signal to noise ratio. We have gamma b, which is the instantaneous signal to noise ratio. It is chi squared distributed. We have this relationship here. So this is exponential, right? Chi is distributed? Yeah. Is it in the statement? No, this is the probability of error calculation. No, the probability of gamma b. Probability. Gamma b. Oh, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. You're right. So, so 
Yeah, so this is the actual PDF of, of, of this guy, yes. Thank you. Yeah, so, so basically the, uh, the, the PDF of gamma B is equal to 1 over the average of gamma B uh, e to the minus gamma B over average of gamma B for gamma B being greater than equal to 0. Yep, 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 yep. And then in order to get that gamma B average value, what you do is you take the alpha squared, which is the Rayleigh distribution, take the average of that, and then multiply by the power of a per bit divided by the noise power spectral density. Oh, yeah, like, you know, just take my word for it. Or look at the textbook, you know. Everyone's, like, looking at me. Yeah, is that really true? Okay. So what happens is, given this, what happens now? So what happens is the prob bit error probabilities for these two modulation schemes okay, um, is equal to the following. And what happens is I use the following integral in order to get, get to this. Well, not me, but in order to get to this, you can use the following integral expression. Right? So what you do is you take your noise PDF. So what does your noise PDF do? Your noise PDF essentially characterizes how your noise behaves in terms of probability. It's a weighing average. And then what is the probability bit error for a specific gamma b? So what happens is, what we're trying to do, we're averaging all the probability bit errors for every gamma b across all gamma b's. And that's that chi-squared distribution that's laid out in that equation, that exponential. Okay? So what we get at the end are these weird-looking type of expressions from this. So now what happens is when the fading is rapid enough and we no longer have perfect synchronization, what do you do in that case? Use differential, right? So whenever synchronization is tough, you use dBPSK or dQPSK or whatever sort of differential modulation scheme in order not to have to worry too much about the synchronization. So like for instance, like Whenever my, um, you know, any of my students, they, they play around with USRPs and such like that, um, what's their modulation scheme that they use? Always differential. So we don't have to worry about the synchronization issues. It makes life so much easier, right? And so if you do a differential modulation scheme, then you don't have to worry. Like, you know, you can tolerate a little bit of fast fading type of characteristics, but look at the performance that you get. If you plot this, how will the performance fare? Differential versus, let's say, regular BFSK or BPSK, right? So in non-coherent detection, because so that's like an envelope and square law, we saw those as well. And suppose you have orthogonal FSK signals, you also have this performance. So I'm just like sort of throwing all these equations. So again, for more details, you can check out the course textbook, but I think that only will give you a little bit more math, but not much more. So for something like this with fading and stuff, I actually am trying to think of any good references out there that kind of look at this sort of stuff in terms of fading. There are probably a few, few good ones out there. If I remember, I'll send an email out to the class. But really what I want to get to, so you, know, so you can summarize you know, the probability of bit error by these approximations. But what I really want to get to is, so I talked about this several times. And, I hope this raises some fear as it does me whenever I think of this. You know, in the past. Now I think it just seems cool. What is Nakagami M? So, in a nutshell, so we all know what kind of the distribution looks like for Rayleigh and Ricean, right? So Nakagami M, your parameter is alpha. So it characterizes statistically the Nakagami M distribution. And, um, you know, it has, like, let's say you have this random variable. The PDF essentially consists of a gamma function. You have the average of the, you know, the SNR or whatever it is, m to the m, gamma to the minus 1, uh, m minus 1, and then e to the minus m gamma over gamma average, right, in order to find the probability. Um, well, no, th this is just the distribution, right, for the Nakagami m. And then we're told what the gamma is equal to, the uh, gamma bar. What happens is, and I forgot what parameter it is, if it's either m is equal to 0 or m equals 1, this degenerates into either Ricean or Rayleigh, depending on what parameter. So this guy is supposed to be a superset 
type of distribution for the other distributions. Okay. So sometimes, like, you know, folks are looking at this because it characterizes a specific propagation environment very nicely, and that might be not, which might not be characterized by either a Rayleigh or a Ricean model. Okay? So I just wanted to give kind of like heads up, there's this thing called Nakagami M. Okay, but that's the last time I'm going to say it. Let's move on. Okay. I sort of want to conclude this lecture with something kind of like, again, 30,000 feet type of cool stuff. Okay, so what do I mean by diversity? Okay, so this is going to be like the last portion, I promise. Ah. So what do I mean by diversity? Any thoughts? So, so think about it. So what I talked about before, so remember we talked about single transmit antenna, single receive antenna, Multiple paths, they might be uncorrelated, right? And we talked about what happens when they're uncorrelated paths. Um, essentially, tau 1 and tau 2 are represent, related through some sort of delta function in order to make them equal throughout the entire inspection that we saw before for the autocorrelation and the power spectral density, right, of these channels. But what happens if we can create multiple copies, send them down um, uncorrelated paths, but they're picked up by let's say separate receivers, and then combine somehow by some, like, let, let's say both signals are <coughs> intercepted, they both experience different types of distortion, and then we make a decision which one to choose, or how to combine the two together, right? So, so what, what, what diversity is, it's almost like, so how many people here, okay, how many people here drive a car? You have a car? Yes, I can't you can drive. No, I mean, how many people have a car? Okay, have a car. Okay, so it goes down. Okay. Okay, so that's one. Matt, Paolo? No, not yet. You guys. So, four. So you don't have a car? No car? Car? You have a car. Okay, so five. You guys? Okay, so five guys. Three? No. So of, you, of the five of you, how many of you have a flashlight in your car? One. Two. Three. Okay. No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. And how about you, uh, Peng Fei? Car, uh, flashlight? No, no flashlight. Okay. Okay. So two people without flashlights, depending on iPhone too much. <laughs> okay. Of the three of you guys, do you have two flashlights in your car? In case one has no battery working, or an LED flashlight. No, okay, that counts. No, no, okay. So, and then, because, so here's the thing. So, it's almost like the concept of be prepared. Like, let's say if one thing fails, you have a backup, right? So, so the case of communication systems, what happens is they usually have like when we talk about diversity, okay, now you're showing off that keychain with flashlight. Oh, no way! If you're trying to, if you're trying to change a tire, that is useless. It's like. <laughs> okay, lecture over. I'm going out. No, 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 no. Okay, okay. No, I, I, you know, maybe if you're trying to get attention of someone driving by, I need help. Do 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 do. You know, Morse code, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fine, I'll give that to you. But okay, so in a communication system, it's always great because we, we, you expect the unexpected. You don't know if there's going to be sudden fading, sudden distortion, sudden anything that can affect the signal. So what you want to do is you want to have some sort of mechanism where if one signal, your signal is being corrupted, you have a backup, right? So like for instance, if you have replicas of your same signal going through space, being picked up by different receivers, and what happens is, let's say, one of those copies is so, so destroyed by deep fade in time, like, like suppose I open a door and that changes the channel properties in this room ginormously. What happens is, 
that's dead. I can never recover information from that signal. But I have several other copies that I can recover information from. Yay! What are ways of being diverse? Frequency diversity. What I can do is, let's say, down several frequency channels that are separated. Let's say um, I have one signal at F1. I have a copy of that signal at F2. Another copy of that signal at F3. And let's say I have frequency selective fading. <laughs> Destroys the signal at F1. But F2 and F3 save today, and I have absolutely no disruption to my information. There's a caveat. I'm going to bring it up in a few minutes, but I just want to sort of motivate how wonderful diversity is. Time diversity. Imagine if I repeat things multiple times. Hi, 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 how are, are, are you, 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 you? To do, to do, do, day, 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 day. What happens is, let's say people are talking, and most of my words are drowned out. You can still recover what I'm saying. It will be annoying as heck, but it will, you will be able to recover what I'm saying. Antenna diversity. So if my ears are this far apart and I hear a lot of noise on this ear, this other ear will be able to pick up what I'm hearing from Matt or Paolo. Angle of arrival diversity. What I hear here might sound very different from here, here, and here. And then my favorite, underused, but really cool, polarization diversity. And so if you're in Professor Makarov's class, which is just across the hallway, he will tell you that you can design an antenna where you can send information polarized like this and polarized like this. And let's say one of the polarizations is corrupted. You can still recover everything from the other one. It's simple, but I think there's probably there's the devils in the details, right? Ha, ha, ha. What's the trade-off? Where do you pay the piper in terms of diversity? Time, 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 derv, 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 You know, if, if I did that, multiple copies, my throughput takes a hit, right? I have to make L copies in time when I could be sending L, in that L copies, I could send L different sets of information, right? So what happens is diversity takes up space. It takes up hardware. It makes more things more complex in order to have more error-free performance. So how would you do this? So let's say, for instance, we have this guy here. So we have binary, binary signaling, again, BPSK, BFSK. And we have these L replicas. We have the fading channels. And so what we can do is, let's say we send copies of these guys. And each one of them experiences fading differently for themselves. So this is interesting. So we have Rayleigh random variables, right? Which means that. We don't know exactly how each, each copy is going to be attenuated, right? So the more copies I send, the more insurance I have that at least one of them should be good, right? So what happens is, let's say I send these copies down these different channels. So we can model the entire diversity scheme as propagating through independent, uncorrelated channels these paths, if we design it right. So rule of thumb with antenna diversity. If you have multiple antennas and you, at the transmitter and receiver, and you're doing something like MIMO, where you have to have um, totally uncorrelated paths, what's the rule of thumb? How, many, like how far apart should the signals be? 10 lambda. That's usually rule of thumb. If you want to do beam forming, which is highly correlated, you should be at most lambda away, and preferably like half a lambda or something like that. You know? So very different beast. But here, if you do in multiple antennas, 10 lambda. It's, about, it's, it's like the rule of thumb. Oh, I got so burned when I did my master's thesis defense many, many moons ago, because I used the term rule of thumb too loosely, too many times. And then they say, find me a reference. So you have to find a book that says, oh yeah, mm, 10 lambda. Yes. You have that reference? Uh, no. Ah, OK. But so why are you saying uh, replicas are just a bit? Because so let's you, say. If you view it as like just more throughput, so you'd actually get more out of it if you encode, rather than you encode. So there is something also called spatial multiplexing. 
So what happens is you can go all out and just send all replicas. You can go all out, and if your channels are uncorrelated, you can say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go, go for it all and just transmit unique data down every one of those paths and maximize my good put to the highest possible. Or what I can do is I can code across all those diverse paths such that if I'm destroyed in one, I can recover most of my information down the other L minus one paths. Yeah, totally. Now the question is, how do you do that? Design me such a coder, right? Something like that. Yeah, so see, that's no longer a research question. <laughs> so that's exactly it. And then, then you have some sort of combiner, and then you do the decision making. Now, what happens is even the decision making, how do you do it? And the bigger question is, how do you do it in a real world scenario, right? So there's something called maximum ratio combining, right? So MRC. It's like, Oh, I, I have more confidence that's more correct than that. And you can use things like SNR or channel conditions and such, and then weigh this guy more or less based on how much negative interference he picks up or she picks up. You can do something called equal gain combining. It's like, I consider all these paths equally good. And then my favorite, <gasps> antenna selection. It's like, I'm going to choose the guy that looks the best at this time and forget about the rest. In fact, in computer science, when you transmit packets, do you think, you know, do the packets sort of get weighed and merged together? No! First come that looks good, I take and I drop the rest, right? Now here's a very interesting thing. MRC is kind of complex, especially if you have multiple copies that you're trying to consider, right? Especially when it comes to hardware. Imagine if you had, oh, I'm going to do MRC on 10 replicas. So you have 10 antennas, 10 R front ends, 10, like an algorithm that needs to handle 10 different sets of data. What do you do? Especially if you only have five R front ends and five antennas. Or let's say 10 antennas, five R front ends, and limited computational cap capabilities. And Antenna subset selection followed by MRC. So what you do is you discard the worst five. Don't hurt their feelings when you say that to them. And then what happens is the remaining five, you merge them together, right? So, and, and what happens is depending on which antennas you want to select, they're gonna, you, know, you can sort of test them all out, right? So you probably have seen this before. Something called a match filter. I wonder what that is. Ha ha ha. So what happens is our model is such that, you know, at the receiver, we have this phase corrupted, attenuated receive signal with complex Gaussian noise for every one of these symbols. And so what we want is we want to optimally demodulate them. And so what we do is if we know what that sim what we have is a bank of symbols. We have a bank of symbols that we know that the transmitter can send. And they're time reverse, so they're optimal. They're optimal. That's the match filter. We see which one yields the sort of highest peak SNR. And then at the same time, we have something called a combiner. And what we do is, let's assume that we don't do antenna subset selection. What it does is, like as I mentioned, you have selection, equal gain combining, maximum ratio combining, which is the optimal. What happens is, let's say you do this in parallel. So already we're talking about lots of hardware. Well, maybe not lots of hardware, but the complexity. So now you have multiple paths, lots of maximal ratio combiners. Now we need to combine all, it's, it gets messy, right? How do you make this, like for instance, let's say two out of the three paths I think is this symbol, but this other path I think is another one. Oh, majority rule, two out of, two out of three say it's this, so we go with that, right? So whatever you do, don't choose something that has an even number of diversity paths. I'm just kidding. I'm just saying in this case, so, you know, because otherwise, how do you get the tiebreaker? So what happens is, suppose we use MRC, okay? So we have MRC, maximal ratio combining. It uses knowledge about the channel attenuation. So the channel attenuation will be our weighing factor, okay? 
So we have channel attenuation and the phase. So what we do is the MRC single decision variable is equal to this guy here. So what is this guy? So let's say this U is a real. So we know that this guy is now complex Gaussian squared. Well, actually, no, 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 no. That's the attenuation. So this is chi squared. That's just Rayleigh. Oh, that noise. Oh, great. Energy of the signal. So it's all this sort of messiness, right? And we have to take the real of that. So we only, in reality, what happens is we know that this is just the envelope. So this is real to begin with. But the NK is actually complex Gaussian. We only take the real portion of that, right? Because it's multiplied by a real. We know that chi squared is also going to be real. It's not going to be complex. So the real doesn't really matter there. So when we do all of this, now what we want to do is we say, OK, this is going to be our weighing function for doing the MRC. So what ends up happening is let's say we look at Rayleigh fading. Let's look at that alpha being a Rayleigh random variable, right? So what do we have here? Uh-oh, right? Um, so what happens is we have like this alpha term, an alpha squared term. That's our attenuation, which is a Rayleigh random variable. And we get both the mean and the variance. And so if we plug this back into those expressions for the probability of error, or in this case, the probability that u is less than 0, okay? We have this sort of uh, Q function expression. And what happens is, is that this SNR, this gamma B term, is equal to essentially the sum of all those Rayleigh fading terms squared and then the energy over the noise power spectral density. And what is interesting about this form? when I'm trying to take like expectations of this and such and bring it. Basically, whenever I have sum of IID random variables, it's kind of a cool idea to use characteristic functions, right? Or moment generating functions or whatever. Basically, that family where we say, oh yeah, it's IID. Let's take the expectation of the complex exponential of that random variable, which is a sum of IID random variables. What will happen? Oh, they're independent. We can break up that complex. We can break up that complex exponential into individual exponentials multiplied by each other. Oh, they're independent. Now the e is applied piecemeal on each one. We can individually characterize them, right? Remember probability. So what happens is we get this guy in return. How does so? So in fact, let's apply it here. So what happens is we have this mean term in everything. And again, we use this, 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 this sort of statistical independence across all these gamma k's. And what it ends up being is it's, they're all IID. So here's the statistical characterization of one of those gamma k's. We have L of them, right? L diversity paths. So what we get is essentially the characteristic function of one of those guys brought to the L power because they're L of them. And what is its PDF? What happens is, what is the PDF of the lone guy is him. So what we're trying to do, essentially, is we know what this guy is here. What is its noise distribution? Of this case, it's a binary modulation scheme, probably BFSK. We need to find out what is the, what is the, whatchamacallit, the PDF of that SNR, integrate across all the SNRs to give me what the average performance is of this guy. So what we're doing here, so let's, let's back up, because I just showed you a lot of math, and everyone's like, oh dear, I'm falling asleep. What's going on? Here's what's going on. What I'm doing is I'm taking the signal-to-noise ratio, which is being influenced. It's being enhanced by this diversity combining. So what I'm doing is, through this process, I'm enhancing my signal-to-noise ratio because there's more signal through these different diversity paths. There's a gain there, but the noise is the same, right? And maybe in a few places, also the attenuation might be different. What we're trying to do is we're trying to account for all these parameters across all these diversity paths. We make one signal, one single signal-to-noise ratio term. We now have an expression for probability of error, and we want to average 
across all those signal to noise ratio terms, which we now have a distribution for, which is basically the characteristic function of one of those paths and its characteristic function brought to the elf power. Cool, huh? So, what you end up getting if you go through this stuff, okay, so a lot of math, is this sort of approximation at the end of the day. So this thing, oh, and you, whenever you see something like an n chooses k, you know, you know that there's something more happening behind the scenes there is. So, so I think, again, like, you know, I think the thing is, all of you should be aware that there's this concept called diversity. And what it does is it's supposed to enhance the performance of the system. If you use MRC, what you're essentially doing is you're trying to take multiple copies and trying to weigh how well or how poorly they're being reassembled at the receiver, and then you can characterize by weighing, based on the channel characteristics, what the performance is, see how well or how poorly they perform in order to get a common statistic. If you do e, EGC, equal gain combining, you don't have that sort of weighted thing. It's like, this guy who's doing poorly, I'm considering him just as equally as him who's doing well. And then you have the selection, right? I take him because he's the best, and forget about the rest. Hey, that rhymes. So, EFTS, exercise for a student, read the remainder of section 13.4-1. Okay, and so with that, uh, that concludes uh, tonight's lecture. And thank goodness, because I think everyone's like, oh, not enough caffeine. <laughs>